بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد إنما يتقبل الله من المتقين صدق الله العظيم My dear respected brothers and sisters My dear friends Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We're in the midst of this month of Sha'ban which is the prelude to Ramadan Today we've begun the 15th night of this blessed month of Sha'ban and some of you may be wondering why you have this auspicious night this great night of Laylatul Bara'a as we say shab -e barat Shab means night in Arabic for those you know some people say the night of shab -e barat which is actually incorrect because Shab in it's a Persian word used in Urdu and other languages to mean night so the night of Bara'a of exoneration very close to Ramadan Ramadan has a very important night, Laylatul Qadr, the night of predestination, decree, power. Numerous virtues mentioned about many of the nights of Ramadan, the odd nights of Ramadan, Laylatul Qadr, etc. So why do we have to have this 15 days beforehand? For some people, they may think it's a bit of a mistake. Why couldn't we have it six months before? It's not a mistake at all. This is a pre-wash. Because for somebody to benefit most from Ramadan, if they go into it with proper preparation and, and care, generally when we have washing, if there are certain items that need a pre-wash. There are certain pre-washing detergents that you add to it before it goes into the main wash. Ramadan is essentially just like Hajj. Ramadan and Hajj, the difference between the two, they are both sales from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which Allah is offering huge amounts of reward for those who want, to, who want them. The only difference is that Hajj is for the elite. What I mean by the elite is that you have to pay for it. For that sale, you have to actually go to the store. You know, you have to go to the shop. You have to make an effort and spend money and go to Haramain go to Makkah, Mukarramah, Mina, etc. and go through that whole spiritual washing machine. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides Ramadan as something you can shop online. It comes to your doorstep. Wherever you are in the world, whatever your state may be, whatever class you may be from, Ramadan comes to everybody. And it is not a worship that only the rich can do. In fact, the poor find it much easier. It's about abstinence, abstinence from food, drink and, in, and sexual intercourse with the spouse. These are the things that Ramadan is all about. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us prepared before that. That's why there are numerous hadiths related by Imam Bukhari and Muslim that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would not be seen fasting more in any other month outside of Ramadan than Sha'ban. Aisha radiallahu anha relates that he would fast, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would fast as though he's not going to stop. In the month of Sha'ban. So Sha'ban was full of fasts. So we've gone through half of the month of Sha'ban. So the layout for today's talk is that we're going to speak very briefly about Sha'ban itself because we've passed half of it already and some of the virtues I've already mentioned. Then we're going to speak a bit about Laylatul Bara'a tonight. But then most importantly, I want to speak about how to maximize the benefit from tonight in a practical perspective. We, this night comes, as I said, every year. So it's this perfect pre-wash before Ramadan. You practice a few of the fasts during the Sha'ban so that when Ramadan comes, these uh, fasts that we generally assume are going to be very difficult because of the long hours that we have and the heat of the summer months uh, in which they occur nowadays. However, subhanAllah, Allah gives us the ability, even people with diabetes and other forms of illnesses, they find that it's, they feel that it's going to be very difficult, but once they actually start keeping the fast, Allah gives uh, 
amazing ability during this month that a person fasts. On any other day, if a person with diabetes hasn't eaten for a certain number of hours, they'll get their low blood sugar. And Ajib in Ramadan, there's uh, some inner energy. Women have energy in Ramadan. Have you seen the new kinds of foods that come out that don't come out for the rest of the year? Have you guys seen that? I know they probably do it because you guys make them make it, right? Uh, otherwise, they'll get in trouble if they don't have the samosa and all this kind of stuff at iftar, all this unhealthy stuff that makes you then burp in taraweeh, right? But anyway, there's ajib barakah during this month of Ramadan. So Sha'ban, uh, if we zoom right into uh, the Laylatul Bara'a aspect, which inshallah tonight is a unified Laylatul Bara'a, mashallah, there are a number of narrations, a number of narrations, uh, for example, one is related by Imam Abu, uh, by Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu in which he says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that إِنَّ اللَّهِ لَيَطَّلِعْ فِي لَيْلَةِ النِّصْفِ مِنْ شَعْبَانِ فَيَغْفِرْ لِجَمِيءِ خَلْقِهِ إِلَّا لِمُشْرِكٍ أَوْ مُشَاحِنٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a num uh, number of hadith related in a similar fashion from a number of different sahaba all narrations are sahih about the worship of the night of Ramadan, about the virtue of the night of Ramadan, all of these are sahih. The ones which are weak are about the fasting of the day. Those are, there's one hadith which is weak, right? So that's why there's a difference of opinion as to whether a person should fast on the day or not. Especially, I mean, in terms of ge general fasting, because 15th of Sha'ban falls into the middle three days of the, each month, which is sunnah to fast during that time anyway. So in that sense, it can be covered. In that sense, it's covered anyway, in that sense. However, the virtue for the night is undisputed in a sense, in a, in a general sense. Anybody who's, the only person who rejects the virtues of this night is an exaggerator. It's somebody who's just gone beyond moderation. Because as I will explain to you, there are a number of narrations uh, that Imam Al-Mundhiri has related in his Targheeb or Targheeb that speak about this special virtue of this 15th of Sha'ban. I mean, I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will tell you what they contain. I'm not going to relate all of them to you, but I will tell you the virtues that they contain so that you have them in mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it says that he descends onto, this, onto the, the, the lowermost heavens. And thus that is trying to say that I am as close to you as possible and thus whatever you ask for, it will be given to you. So we are very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah makes himself closer to us in fact. We're however distant or far we are. Allah brings himself close to us. Allah, Allah opens up himself to us. You ask and he will give. So at the end of the day, the only person that will be deprived is who wants to remain at a distance. Allah is willing to give us that closeness and proximity. The only person that's going to be depri deprived is the person who doesn't want that proximity, who still re wants to remain far. Number two, Allah showers His mercy in, um uh, in abundance and He forgives His servants on this night. In fact, there's a narration which says that Allah liberates people on this night. Bara, exoneration. Allah liberates people on this night from the hellfire, equivalent to the number of the hair on the goats of Banu Kalb. There was a tribe called the Banu Kalb and they had a lot of goats. So it says that their goats were very hairy. So the number of hairs, if you try to, if, if you try to enumerate and count the number of hairs on a goat, I mean, it, it's a lifelong process to do that. It's not an easy thing to count hairs on, 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 on anybody. Um, so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberates people from the fire equivalent to the number of hairs on the goats of the Banu Kalb tribe. However, the, that's all well and good. That's all understood. The problem is that there will be people who will unfortunately be deprived of this virtue. Though they may be wanting the virtue. One is a person doesn't care. The, another person is the one who wants to try to gain something from this night. Prepare the heart so that there's some purification gained before the month of Ramadan. So then the nur of Allah just enters the heart during the month of Ramadan. However, there are certain people who will be deprived, prevented and blocked from these benefits. And these are people, uh, again, I, I won't mention every single narration, but as a conclusion, these are the people who are mentioned as being, uh, as, as being deprived of these special blessings on this day. One is a polytheist, an idol worshipper. Number two is an alcohol, uh, number two is a person with enmity and hatred in their heart for somebody else without any valid reason. A person who is so hard-hearted, he doesn't want to forgive. 
The other person has maybe sought forgiveness numerous times. But this person says, Zindagi bar. For the rest of my life, I will not forgive you. I mean, really a person like this is setting himself up to be prevented from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person should realize that we need more mercy from Allah than we can show to somebody else. And Allah will show us mercy. Man, uh, as the, Allah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamkum man fis sama. You have mercy on those who are on the earth. And those in the heavens will pray for mercy for you, the angels. Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhum ar-Rahman. Those who show mercy, the Rahman, the most merciful one, the abundantly merciful one, will have mercy on those who show mercy to others. Part of giving somebody forgiveness is showing them mercy. It's one of the ways of showing mercy, creating brotherhood between. So a person who bears enmity and hatred without a valid reason, then this is a person who's going to be deprived. Number two is a, uh, number three is a murderer. Number four is a prostitute. Number five is an alcohol addict. And number six is a disobeyer of parents. And of course, after that is a person who, uh, number, number seven is a person who breaks relations with people. Who, again, it ties into the second point there. And a person, they say, whose trousers extend beyond their ankles uh, for ostentation uh, purposes. Now, all of these people are deprived on this night. However, there's a, an interesting point here. These people are deprived only if they do not repent on this night all of these people can be forgiven on this night if they make repentance and thus they will no longer remain an alcoholic they will no longer remain a person who has severed his ties with others no longer will that prostitute remain a prostitute these are people who have made the tawbah on this day basically the way i look at it is that allah is saying i'm giving you this special offer today to be forgiven if you take that offer, you are forgiven. The only person who is not forgiven is who doesn't want the offer. Who doesn't want to extend their hands. Who doesn't want to shed a few tears. Who doesn't want this special thing and gift on this day. So essentially, the sales are open to all. Except anybody who doesn't want it. And these are the people who want to persist in this regard. That's why... There is a hadith related by Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah turns his entire attention to creation, to the creation on this day, meaning on the 15th night of Sha'ban, and he forgives all of them except those who ascribe partners to him, those who harbors enmity in his heart. This is one of the narrations. It mentions the two people who are deprived. I just want to mention because I know that we have... Um, Certain people who think that there is no virtue for this night. There is no virtue for this night. But from my experience, I have not seen any other night in the entire year outside of Ramadan which gets more filled with people than this Sha'ban. Than this 15th of Sha'ban. There's always, mashallah, full house in the masjid, pretty much. And this comes from our tradition and heritage, which is based on these Sahih narrations. This narration that I mentioned from Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu is related from Imam Tabarani in his Al-Mu'jamul Awsat and in his Al-Mu'jamul Kabir. Also, Ibn Hibban has classified this narration as Sahih. The reason why I'm going into all of this is because, as I said, for some people there is some confusion about whether this night has any merit or not because there are people out there who have exaggerated in this regard and tried to discredit this night that's why i'm mentioning this just so that you know uh, likewise uh, hafiz al-haythami uh, has mentioned that all the narrators of this hadith are reliable the great hadith scholar of the uh, uh, one of the great hadith scholars of the present day sheikh shu'ib al arnaut and a number of others even nasiruddin albani right number of others who generally is very quick to uh, sometimes make hadith da'if and weak. Even he considers this hadith as sahih. And not only that, it's mentioned in numerous narrations. There's another narration related by Imam Bayhaqi and Musnad al-Bazzar from Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu of a very similar nature. Um, as I said, I didn't want to belabor this point too much, but I just want to now mention to you from the tabi'een and some of the great scholars of the past what they thought of this day. Ata ibn Yasar, the great tabi'i of Medina Munawwara, who 
uh, says that after Laylatul Qadr, after the 27th or whatever night it may be of Ramadan, there is no other night in the year that is more virtuous than the 15th night of Sha'ban, the middle night of Sha'ban. Number two, the Khalif Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he wrote to his governors in Basra. He wrote to his governor while he was, while he was the Khalif. He wrote to his governors in Basra. Allah Ta'ala pours his mercy in abundance on four nights of the year. So ensure that you benefit from them. And one of them that he mentioned was the middle night of Sha'ban. Imam Shafi'i, Rahimah, the great Imam, he mentions that du'as are accepted by Allah Almighty on this 15th of Sha'ban. He relates that this is related in Sunan al-Bayhaqi and also related in Lata'if al-Ma'arif of Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. Likewise, Imam Awza'i was of the view that people should engage in individual worship on this night. Imam Awza'i, the great alim of the great alim of Damascus, of Syria. He was considered the greatest of the tabi'een and ulama, imams of, uh, of, of Syria. Likewise, uh, Imam Ishaq ibn Rahway, or Rahuya also approved of spending the night of worship in the masjid, uh, uh, this night uh, in worship. Above all, Ibn Taymiyyah, Hafiz ibn Taymiyyah, who many people who have issues with this night would generally quote from. He himself says, as for the middle night of Sha'ban, there are various narrations that have been narrated regarding its significance. And it has been reported from a group of the Salaf that they practice this. Hence, such a deed cannot be disputed. This is what he says. And this is related, if you want the reference, in his Majmu' al-Fatawa, uh, volume 23, page 132. Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali himself, again, numerous Hanbali scholars approved of this night. Every Muslim is recommended to avail himself for ibadah on this night. And number of other narrations which we don't have time to go into. But now, how do we spend this night? Once we've understood, Alhamdulillah, the first and foremost thing is that we've taken the first step. All those who are in the masjid today, right? So all those people who have performed Isha prayer in the masjid, do you know what you've just earned? Allahu Akbar. There's a hadith related in Sahih Muslim and Sunan Abu, Abu Dawood. It says that one who performs Isha in congregation, in Jama'ah, and then anybody who performs Isha in congregation gets the reward of spending half the night in worship. Right? Then anybody who follows that up with Fajr in congregation gets the reward of the other half night in worship, even if in between you slept the whole night. Making Fajr and Isha in Jama'ah in the Masjid gives you the reward of spending the entire night in worship. Now that doesn't mean that you do those two and then you go to sleep at home. Right? What you'll get is you'll get the base reward of spending the night in worship. But of course any other deeds during, done during the night, you get those additional rewards. So you get a significant amount of base reward to start with, which is very valuable on the day of judgment but you do extra inshallah during the night as well so alhamdulillah you've prayed isha now make sure you come for fajr let's have a similar if not a greater number especially of those who are listening at home they weren't able to make it for isha for whatever reason at least come for fajr so you get the second half inshallah number two on this night, if you do sleep, I mean, we don't have many hours to sleep, really. I mean, it's short days anyway, depending on what your Fajr time is, 18, 15, 12 degrees or whatever it is. If you're going, I think, you guys go about 18 degrees, right? So you're, you're going to have about a few hours, right? It's not much. It's easy to stay awake Sunday tomorrow. There's no, inshallah, work for many of us. So khalas, it's, it's a line day tomorrow, so you spend the night. However, if somebody does sleep on this night, sleep with wudu. This should be a practice that we do all the time. Whenever you, before you go to sleep, try to sleep with wudu. The benefit of that as related by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the great muhaddith, hadith master and Shafi'i jurist. He relates that the soul of the one who sleeps with wudu makes prostration at the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very significant to sleep on wudu whenever you can. Number three, if nothing else on this night, 
abstain from sin. So you don't need to watch news, it's depressing anyway. Right? And it's only half the night you'll be, you know, it's only half the day that you'll be uh, away from news. No, 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 get, you know, get away from your WhatsApp messages, which is a massive fitna today. Right? Just not, I mean, I'm not saying that's a sin necessarily, but it's a waste of time. But avoid any kind of sin during this night. Specifically during this night, avoid any kind of sin. I know it's a Saturday night. I know it's a night where people go out and do things. But Alhamdulillah, you guys are out. And you are doing things here. Inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and assist us. So abstain from sins. So if you don't get anything, at least we don't lose anything. And number four, as mentioned in those ahadith, clear your heart. Clear our hearts from ill feelings towards other Muslims. I don't know how much we can stress this. This is such a preventer of Allah's mercy. Uh, breaking ties with people. And you know, there's a, most people know that there's a famous hadith about breaking ties. What's the maximum number of days that you can stop talking to somebody for? Three days. Three days. Everybody knows that. And it may be something that many of us may not know. <clears throat> that you know these three days, that is for none relatives which means brothers and sisters parents children uncles aunts anybody blood relatives kin this hadith doesn't relate to them this relates to anybody besides them any tom dick and harry anybody your neighbor your friend or whatever any other person kin you're not even supposed to break up for more than a minute you should just avoid it because that is how societies break up when families deteriorate. So they're not even, this hadith relates to outside of the kin. So if somebody has problems with their brother or sister, whatever the case is, they're basically just telling Allah, okay, you know, I'm one of those guys. We need to find that softness in our heart. Making up with somebody doesn't mean that you have to then become buddy-buddy and go and have dawits at their house. Or go and always hang out. Because you know, like there are certain people, they being with them is a is like a torture. Right. I mean, I, come on. I mean, that's some people are just very unreal. They talk too much. They just every you know that every time you're going to be with them is going to cause a bit of an issue. That 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 doesn't mean that just because you make up that you have to go and sit and do everything with them, like become best of pals and buddies and friends. No, salam, sharing their happiness and grief. Give them a call once in a while if they're related to you or whatever the case is. Help them out, assist them. That's the idea. The idea to make up with somebody doesn't mean it has to be some kind of intense relationship. It's just that don't break it completely with anybody. Then, what else can you do? Number five, Salatul Tasbih. Very powerful. The method of it, um, you should know, somebody can explain that later to you. Which is the four rak'ah prayer in which there's 75 extra tasbihat. Uh, in every rak'at and the uh, du'as are supposed to be accepted after that. So this is, uh, you can do that. Number six, above all, tawbah, repentance, repentance. Allah purify our, our hearts, uh, remove our sins. And number seven, dhikr. Now, you see, uh, Ibn Ata'illah al-Iskandari has this wonderful statement. He says that because Allah knows that human beings are made in a way that they get bored easily from a single type of activity. That's why he varied the forms of worship. He made different forms of worship because humans generally get bored. So that's why you go home or you stay in the masjid, you do some nawafil prayer, or you get tired of doing that, sit and read some Quran, you get tired of doing that, go and just uh, read some tasbih, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. You get tired of salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, durood sharif. You get tired of doing that, just sit back and just think about your relationship with Allah, muraqabah, kind of meditation. Just, just do that. You get tired of doing that, then do something else. Just these very different things that you can do, just spending the night for the sake of Allah in these various different ways. Tilawah of the Quran, uh, dhikr, tawbah, dua, etc. We want to maximize our time. Now, there is something very specific that I want to deal with today in relationship to this night and to any other great night and to just general, uh, uh, generally this practice on its own. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord says, in the Quran, your Lord says, Udruni, call upon me, 
call on to me, ask me. Astajib lakum, I will answer you. I will respond to you. That is what Allah is saying. He's saying, call upon me. He's giving a hukum, a command, and I will respond to you. Allah is the only one who can change the states of people. Allah is the only one who is in absolute control of the states and the hearts of people, and He does it as He wishes. For us, if we want to do something different, we have to adopt its means. If we want, if we're hungry, what do I do? I go and get some food. I eat something and I put something into my stomach. For many things, we need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has so much power and so much ability that you know the normal effects that we see in things. Allah has the ability to change those. The reason is that our belief is that anything that, for example, a knife generally cuts, fire generally burns, paracetamol generally removes your headache, generally. However, none of these things are intrinsic to it. Meaning, it's not through their own capability. That's why we see sometimes paracetamol does not work. And there's people who are on codeine and, and cocodamol and some other crazy stuff, right? And nothing else works with them, you know? Uh, even that doesn't work sometimes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who occasions everything by giving it permission each time. This, this is our belief. Now if you think that that could make him wary, لا يؤده حفظهما Nothing makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala weary. It's us who have to delegate tasks because there's only so much that we can do. Allah is in control of everything all at once and He does it as He wishes. However, when Allah wants to remove the effect of something that is generally an accepted effect, He can do so. For example, the best of medicines will stop working, will have no benefit whatsoever. Allah, Allah's will will always prevail. Whatever He wants, that will always be dominant. That's why the son of Nuh alayhi salam, the son of Nuh alayhi salam, despite his father's du'as, was not saved and he drowned. This is a prophet we're speaking about. And not just any normal prophet, but an ulul azmi min ar rusul considered the second father of mankind after Adam alayhi salam. His son did not. His son did not, uh, did not survive. Likewise, Allah, that's because Allah wanted him to perish, so he didn't survive. Allah did not wish Ismail salam to be slaughtered, and thus try as he might, his father Ibrahim salam is trying to sacrifice him according to the command, but he is unable to do so, because Allah didn't want it to happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the Prophet wasallam to eat the honey, despite the fact that the Prophet wasallam took an oath that I will not eat honey again. Allah wanted him to eat the honey and thus he broke the oath and he ate the honey. I'm going to leave that curiosity for those who doesn't, don't understand, know this incident to go and ask your sheikhs afterwards to explain that story to you. Right? It's in the tafsir of Surah Al-Tahreem. Right? Or go and look at the tafsir Ma'rif Al-Quran of Surah Al-Tahreem. But it's a very interesting story. Allah wanted him to eat it. He took an oath to the contrary, the Prophet Sallallahu but he still had to eat it. The reason is that nothing has its own intrinsic efficacy. Everything happens because of being occasioned by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in every instance. And the reason for that is, why does Allah sometimes pull the efficacy and the effect of something out of the thing is to keep servitude the way it is. If everything was always predictable, then we wouldn't need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have this feeling that we are in need. Even the most powerful individual, they run into roadblocks many times. They run into obstacles and then they have to realize that there is a power that is more superior to them. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ad-du'a'u mukhul ibadah. Du'a I'm going to specifically discuss du'a today because I believe that this is one of the most powerful tools that we have for this night. Du'a. Du'a'u mukhul ibadah. The Prophet ﷺ said du'a is the kernel of worship. In another version he says, du'a'u huwa ibadah. Du'a is worship. Now, before I couldn't understand how this was the fact. Because worship is when we're offering something to Allah. We're doing worship for the sake of Allah. Right? It's like we're giving something. When you do du'a, what do you do? Do you give something to Allah or are you asking of something from Allah? 
So that's like more selfish, like I want this, I want that. So how can that be dua? And the Prophet ﷺ is not just saying obliquely that it's a dua. He's saying uh, that, that it's a worship. He's saying it is worship. It's the kernel of worship. It's the essence of worship. It's as big as worship as you can do. The reason is that when we ask Allah something, we are expressing our servitude. Servitude, our need, our helplessness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is one of the highest levels of servitude. The fact that we have succumbed and submitted to Allah. Oh Allah, I need this. I can't get it myself. I can't get it from anybody else. Oh Allah, it is you. And we've recognized who is our superior. We've recognized who is our Lord. That's why dua is, especially if it's sincere, then the more sincere it is, the greater the worship it is. That's why dua is a worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, let us understand something. Let us understand the dynamic here. How much can Allah give? And when does He give? Why does He not give? Because this is what we're all stuck with. We all make dua and then we get tired of it sometimes. Allah doesn't give me. I've been asking for this many months, this many years sometimes. He hasn't given me. So I want to explore this a bit today. First and foremost, what we have to realize is how much Allah can give. What is potential? Allah gives to all. That's the first thing. Allah gives to all. He gives to His lovers. He gives to His detractors. He gives to those who violate, who blaspheme Him. He gives to those who reject Him. He gives those who deny Him. He gives the atheist. He gives the worshipper. And He gives to everybody else. So, why will Allah not give you? If Allah gives to everybody, why will He not give you? Humans are different. See, our point of reference are other human beings. And sometimes we impose that thought on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way we interact and experience other human beings, we think Allah is the same. But this is where we're making our mistake. Yes, with us, with others, they give to friends. They give to people they know. They don't give to just everybody. You know, we don't give to detractors, generally speaking. You know, unless somebody is very altruistic, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to all. So why wouldn't He give you? Number two, some people want to give. Many people want to give, but they cannot. They don't have the ability to give. They don't have the means to give. Or they're too stingy. They want to give, but they can't make themselves give. They've got a, men, a psychological barrier of giving. For some reason, they think they're going to become poor. Or maybe they just don't have. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this can never be the case. Because Allah has abundant. Everything is at His disposal. So if He wants to give, He will give. He has sufficient supplies, more than sufficient supplies to give. Number three, if you go to a wealthy person and you ask him for a pound, that's an affront to them. That's an embarrassment. You go to a wealthy person, you ask them for a pound for something small, they're going to think, you had to come to me for that? You know, you could have asked the doorman. You know, you could have asked my driver. Why are you asking me for that? Likewise, if you go to a poor person, you ask him for a huge amount. He's going to say, Bichala, I'm a pensioner. You're asking me for a hundred thousand loan. Come on, man. What's wrong with you? Are you making fun of me? So asking a wealthy person for something small or asking a poor person for something big is a form of embarrassment. What do you then ask for Allah? What do we then, how much do you think we can ask of Allah who has more than all? Don't ask him for something small. Ask him for everything. Ask him for everything. It's an affront to him that you're only going to ask him for some things and not everything. That's the whole idea here. The next point is that if we are unhappy with somebody, then we won't give them. If we're unhappy with somebody, we won't give them. Allah gives even when he's angry. Ajib. Allah gives even when he's angry. Let me tell you one of the most famous occasions of this. Shaitan, he did what he did to Adam uh, forced him, uh, had him eat of the forbidden fruit or whatever it was. And you can tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very angry because he rejected the shaitan. He said, now you go from here. You are the accursed and the rejected one. Do you think a dua is going to be accepted at this time? Yes. With Allah, yes. The shaitan knows Allah. Remember, the shaitan knows Allah. Unfortunately, he's got a problem that prevents him from acting according to that knowledge, which is, ang which is arrogance. 
Arrogance is a very bad disease. It will, make, it will force you to act against your knowledge, against the better. That's, that's what it is. He knows Allah, so he makes a dua then. He says, he says to Allah, give me respite. Anzir me. Give me respite. Until the day of judgment. And Allah says, innaka min al Yes, you have been given respite. It's a position of anger where he's being accursed, totally away from the rahmah and mercy of Allah, Allah gives him as well. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives even in those times when he's angry with somebody like that, with the shaitan, then why do you think he won't give you an eye? Allah says himself, the Prophet ﷺ says, مَن لَمْ يَدْعِ اللَّهِ Whoever does not ask Allah, يَغْضَبْ عَلَيْهِ Allah gets angry on him. With other people, if you're trying to, somebody's trying to buy a house or somebody wants some money for something very important, right? And he's just mentioning it. He's just mentioning it among his friends, giving them a hint that I need some money. Can you help me out? He doesn't want to ask them and embarrass them. Now, people are going to say, well, he hasn't asked me yet. He hasn't asked me yet. Few people may themselves go forward and say, here, you know, let me help you out. I know you, you know, the, the Sharif in San, you know, the, but some people say, no, 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 no. Now, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gets angry. Why don't you ask me? So if Allah gives when he's angry, then why wouldn't he give us? Number five, with humans, you go to somebody once. Can you please help me out? He helps you out, borrows you his car, right? Maybe gives you whatever. Right? You go to him again. Can you help me out, please? He gives you again. Third time, he gives you again. But now he's becoming a bit of a burden, isn't it? Eventually he's going to say, man, am I the only guy that you see? Like, there's nobody else. What do you think I've got? You know, sab, you know th there's different expressions in different languages that they'll probably use at that time, right? However, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He never tires of giving. The more you ask Him, the more He will be happy. Allah becomes more satisfied with a person the more they ask Him. In fact, with anybody else, the more you ask them, the, the, the more uh, the, they will avoid you eventually. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know what Allah does to a person who asks him often and more often more often? He makes him his wali. He makes him his friend. That person becomes a wali of Allah by asking him. Ask Allah abundantly. Show your servitude and you're new to Allah only. And you will see that you can gain wilayah through this. Allah makes that person a wali of him. Musa alayhi salam asked in Madian and he got refuge. When he went from Egypt and he went to Madian and he asked, Oh Allah, I need your help. I, I am faqir, I am in need of your help. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him refuge. Yusuf alayhi salam, he called out. He called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he becomes a minister in Egypt. He was not from them people, but they made him a minister. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam called out and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him victory. لَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهِ فِي مَوَاتِنَا كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you victory in numerous in many, many places. Yunus alayhi salam called out to him and he gives him relief from the fish. In fact, a most amazing thing is that Musa, uh, Yunus alayhi salam is in this whale. Now, once you go in a whale, the whale or any being does not have the ability to stop the functions of their stomach. You know, from the bile gushing out, from the intestines beginning to work on anything that goes in. It's a natural occurrence. But as I mentioned, that is the norm, but Allah has the ability to stop this. From the control house, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, okay, your internal facility should not work. It should stop the production. It should stop its process. And Yunus alayhi salam stays completely fine. He calls out to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him miraculous relief from this. That's the Allah we're speaking about. So now the question that arises, I ask Allah, why is my dua not accepted? And inshallah, this will be an eye opener for many of us. Because inshallah, this will help us to understand where our mistake is, where our problem is, where the defect is, where the, which part of the form we're not filling properly, what criteria we're not meeting, what qualification we're not fulfilling. That is what this is all about. Number one, we ask Allah, he doesn't accept us because we do not make sufficient tawbah. We have numerous sins in our account. Our heart is filled with the darknesses of our sins. The call that we make to Allah, it's not there. It's not getting there because we do not make enough tawbah. 
See, what happens is, within our own children, if there's somebody who's really good, doing good at school, good at madrasa, he's, mashallah, a star student, he is the coolness, or she is the coolness of our eyes. She gladdens our sight. Mashallah, top student, she's going to carry your name, you know, she's going to take over your business, and you know, she's going to make your name shine in the world, right? He or she. Now, if that child asks you, uh, Abba, I want this or that, your heart is much more open to buying them those things or giving them those things. If you've got an unruly child, he's your child, she's your child, but at the end of the day, you don't, your heart doesn't feel like giving them. Heart doesn't feel like giving them. So now what happens is, we only ask Allah when we're in absolute need and we've exhausted every other possibility. But we're sinning 24 hours a day. And then we kind of send a half-baked dua. They're not used to it. The angels aren't used to that. But somebody who's constantly asking, they know that person's application has been in so many times. They don't have to review it too much. They know this person. Okay, khalas, new application's coming. Here you go, give it to him. Right? It's, a, it's one of those processes. I mean, if you want a human kind of uh, understanding or an example of that. That's why the person who continues to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, continues to seek forgiveness, that person, his du'as are going to be accepted much more faster than somebody else's, generally speaking. Likewise, there's a hadith in Muslim which mentions right, about the person who's come from a very long journey. Journey is a time when we're in a vulnerable state and Allah is with broken hearts, right? Allah is very close to broken hearts and people in stress, people in distress. So a person who's on a journey, whose clothing is soiled and his hair is disheveled, he's asking for Allah, that dua should be accepted. However, it's not accepted because his food, drink and clothing is haram sourced. Haram source is a big prevention from, it's like a perpetual prevention from, from the du'as being accepted. So we ask Allah, it's not being accepted. Maybe there's some garbar, some problem in our source of... That's why a person who has haram food, haram income, whatever it is, and clothing, he can go to the Kaaba, hold on to the multazam, put his cheeks and his chest and everything onto the multazam and his du'a may not be accepted. I'm saying may because Allah's mercy... Still has, knows that if he's there, he's maybe, maybe he's making tawbah, then he will be accepted. But a person who doesn't make tawbah, his won't be accepted. Number two, Allah in many, many du'as does not accept immediately. And we know this. I mean, we know this. Allah doesn't accept immediately because he wants to test his servant. He wants to see how much he really asks. How much does he really want it? Does he really want it? And the example of this is that we should learn to ask Allah like a child. We need to look at children. You know when they want something, what do they do? They are persistent. But there though, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. Drive you mad. They drive you mad. Allah wants to see how much persistence is there. And that is one of the reasons. A child will not stop asking. He will keep asking, keep asking until eventually the mother or father will say, Jawbai, take it. That's how we need to be with Allah. So we need to ask Him. And knowing that we're not bothering him. The child does bother, bother. But here with Allah, it's not you're bothering him to give you. Right? That you're making him tired. It's not that. It's that he wants to see how much you really want this thing. Uh, this ties into the next point. Which is, I think, the biggest problem with all of us. I confess this for myself. It was only when I learned the way the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ were that I then realize what the mistakes in my dua is. And what it is, this is number three, is that we do not know how to ask Allah. What that means is, you know what we do? Oh Allah, give me this, and then give me that one, and then let my daughter have a very good rishta as well, and then you know, give me barakah in my wedding, uh, in, in, my, um, in my business, and give me that nice car, and give me this. And it's like a dictation. Like, you know, in the morning you go to work and say, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this. It's literally we're dictating to Allah as though he's like our servant, and he has to do it. If you look at the Prophet's du'as, Allahu Akbar, he starts off with setting the scene. He never goes in and he hardly ever goes in, jumps in and says, Oh Allah, do this for me. It's La ilaha illallah al azim al halim. La ilaha illallah rabbu al arsh al azim. La ilaha illallah rabbu al samawati al sab'a wa rabbu al arsh al azim. 
There is no Lord except Allah. He knows that. That's clear. It's there. But he mentions it. And he says, this is my Lord of the Arsh, Lord of this, Lord of that, Lord of the seven heavens, Lord of the earth. In another one, he says, oh Allah, I am your slave. I am the child of your male slave and your female slave. Oh Allah, you are my Lord. Oh Allah, this is what my state is. Oh Allah, I've got nothing to show. Oh Allah, this is my qillatul hila. This is the, the paucity of my strategies. I cannot do this, I cannot do that. And then after that, he asks. It's about understanding, setting the scene. Setting the scene, not just barking of orders. It's not a dictating, it's not a dictating process. Then when he doesn't give you, get angry on top. Right? You know, this is just shaitan causing us to uh, basically uh, creating a conflict between us by, by doing this. Allah gives everybody. Allah gives everybody. SubhanAllah. Just, just wait and you will understand. So that's why ask with humility. Put your position down in front of Allah. Oh Allah, you have the ability to do everything. I have nothing. Everything is in your hands. It's easy for you to give me. Oh Allah, please give me. Number four. We may ask verbally, but our heart is not in it. So we sometimes, for those who are, of us who make dua often, we have a number of duas. So we may be asking, but the heart is not in it. The heart is not present. It's just a verbal process. There's no heart, there's no concentration. That's why there's no connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number five, sometimes we make dua, but shaitan tells us that your dua will not be accepted. So on the one hand, we're asking Allah, but we're not really sure he can help us. We're like, I don't know if you're going to get this or not. Believe me, those duas are not accepted. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ask Allah wa anta muqinun bil ijaba. Ask Allah and you must have certainty in your mind He can give you. Subhanallah, there was a Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. You know Hajjaj ibn Yusuf? He was going through a locality. He comes across this blind man who was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he goes up to this blind man and he gives him a push. And he says to this blind, do you know who I am? He says, no, 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 who are you? He says, I'm Hajjaj, Allahu Akbar. You can imagine what happened to this blind man because Hajjaj killed about uh, hundreds uh, hundreds of thousands of people, including many, many Sahaba. Very violent, very, uh, a great tyrant. So uh, he, he says to this blind man, do you know who I am? I'm Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. I am going to be coming back from this path at night. And if I don't see that you haven't got your sight back by tonight, then you are finished. Because the guy was making dua to Allah, Allah give me my sight back. Hajjaj heard him and thus he said to him, by night time, if you don't have your sight back, you are finished. When Hajjaj came back by that night, that person had his sight back. Because then he made that serious dua. All this time he was making dua, looking around him that other people haven't got their sight back. It generally doesn't happen. So I'm going to ask Allah, but you know, it's a half-baked dua. You want something from Allah, believe he can do it, because believe me, he can do it. Do dua like this blind man. Shaitan though will make us think that your dua will not be accepted. You're too sinful. You know, you don't have a beard. You don't cover your hair for the women. You know, you don't do this. You don't do that. You've got this. You've got do that. Yeah, look, we do need to remove these things, but there is toba. But he just makes it think like you're finished forever. You have to remember that if Allah accepted shaitan's dua, who did not make a sajda, why would he not accept your and my dua when we're making so many sajda in front of him? If Allah accepts the dua of shaitan, even though he was taken out of his house, today we are sitting in the house of Allah, why shouldn't Allah accept our dua in his house? Allah accepted shaitan's dua and he thrown him out. And today we're in the house of Allah, why shouldn't Allah accept our dua? If you have been allowed to come into the masjid today, you didn't come by yourself. You were to given enablement by Allah to come into the masjid today. This is a special night. If you've been given the enablement, then why will Allah not accept you? He's brought you all the way to his house. Why should he not accept your dua tonight? Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call upon me, pray to me, ask me and I will give you. That is Allah the most honorable. Allah the most honorable and powerful. So why should he not accept? So Allah, if he accepts shaitan's dua, even though he was rejected, he did not do a sajda. He was alone in asking. Shaitan was alone, person was asking. Today, if we make a dua together, 
then why should he not accept our du'as? If he, uh, if he answered shaitan's du'a alone, then a whole group of Muslimin making du'a, why should he not accept our du'as as a group? Shaitan asked on a normal time, not Laylatul Bara'a, not Laylatul Qadr, not Ramadan. He asked on a normal day, his du'a was accepted. We're asking on Laylatul Bara'a, why shouldn't Allah accept our du'as on this night then? Everything is stacked, insha'Allah, in our favor on this day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I just want to mention um, that you know people ask about these different, can, you know, is it, uh, is it proven that you wipe your face after dua? When a beggar, have you seen a beggar asking? Have you seen beggars? SubhanAllah, the syndicated beggars especially, they break their hand or they break their children's hand when their arm when they're young so that they can grow up to be professional beggars. And even if not, they come with this, you know, a bowl, a cracked bowl sometimes, uh, 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 tatty clothing, right, screwed up face. And all of that is to create a scene so that it softens your heart. Now, if you're going to ask Allah by reclining and just saying, oh Allah, give me this, it's not going to happen. That's why we raise our hands. That's why we cry. Crying softens Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's, there was a, a sheikh who used to be very trustworthy and people used to give him a lot of money to look after. Now he had no place to look after it. So you know what he used to do? People would give him money to look after. He used to take the money and give it in sadaqah here and then. Anybody needed, he would give it. So he was literally just passing it through. Now what happens is some people start coming to collect their money. So this was a special day when everybody wanted their money for some reason. So uh, one person comes, he says, okay, just sit down here, please. Just wait. Another person comes, he says, okay, you sit down here as well. Suddenly he had a whole group of people around him, right? And bichara, they're all waiting for their money. Then this young guy on a cycle, and you know, those who are from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh will know this, right? You, a little kid goes out on a little lari, right? With samosas or something his mom made, right? And he goes out to sell it. Right? So he goes along, this little kid, right, with some sweets or some halwa or something. And so this sheikh, he sees him and he says, Idharal, right? come here and he says, in sabko kilado, right, go and feed all of them. He thinks, well, mashallah, I've sold everything in one go, right? So he gives everybody and all of these guys, you know, he's fed them. And then he sa the, the, the kid goes, where's my money? He says, sit down. Right? So now he's sitting down and suddenly, among all of these people, this poor kid is wondering now, my mom sent me all that stuff. This is what we're going to have our daily food with. And the money has not come. It's been 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, no money. So he starts crying, Bichara. He starts crying. As soon as he starts crying, another man turns up, comes to the sheikh and gives him this whole bag of dinars or dirhams or whatever it was. Right? And the sheikh said, this is what I was waiting for. I was waiting for somebody to tear, to cry. And the mercy of Allah comes down and he paid everybody back. Now, I know this sounds a bit mythical, right? But what I'm trying to say is that if you want your du'as to be accepted, then cry. And that's why the, 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 the hadith mentions, if you can't cry, then make your face like a crying person. My final story before we finish is that Musa alayhi salam once asked for rain. There was a drought. Musa alayhi salam asked for rain for the entire population of that area. But the rain did not come. The du'a is not being accepted. A prophet's dua is not being accepted. So then he had contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Ya Allah, what's happening? Why is my dua not being accepted? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that among you is a person who does namima, calumny, tail bearing, tells one person one thing, goes and tells a story to somebody else, causes friction like this. If he leaves this gathering, your dua will be accepted. So Musa Ali Sam stands up and makes an announcement. Anybody who is guilty of this sin, should leave the majlis right now so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send us rain. Do not deprive us of this. He's waiting. Nobody gets up. Nobody gets up. But you know what? Everybody's looking at each other. Nobody's getting up. Suddenly the rain starts. Suddenly the rain starts. So Musa alayhi salam, he asks Allah afterwards, you said the rain will not start and will not come until this person leaves the majlis. Nobody left the majlis. So why is it that the rain still started? He said, because when you made that announcement, this person who was sitting there made the tawbah. He made the tawbah there, and that's why I have kept him 
I have kept him concealed for all of these years. I did not want to reveal him there as well. He made his tawbah and you got. So if Allah gives when a person, a sinner in this in any gathering makes a tawbah and that brings on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then why should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not accept from us this night if we really ask him so we ask Allah we ask Allah to help us we ask Allah to assist us and we ask Allah to bless us during this night inshallah we will have our dua because uh, the muaddins are just ready to go inshallah we will have our dua after straight after salat we will make a special dua and uh, that will be inshallah our dua. Jazakumullah khair wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all jazak for coming here and bless us during this night.